Okay, so finally, after much delay, I've saw the movie Skyfall, and I must say, uh, my uh, experience with this movie was very, very good. I really did enjoy myself with this movie. Um, the first thing I gotta say is that this movie is pretty much has two parts in it. The first part, um, you pretty much recognize as a typical formula for James Bond, his out location, women, um, the gadgets, which was, by the way, very few and far in between, and uh, some of the occasional good action scenes and good dialogue uh, that you come to expect in a 007 movie, both for better and for worse. However, once the second half has started, this has become a totally different film, and depending on what kind of a Bond fan you are, this will either um, please you or pretty much upset you. Um, I might as well get rid of some of the uh, nitpicks I like to call out the way first because they're very few and far between and there's so much I like to praise this film for what they did right. Um, first off, um, let's just start with um, the overall story which lead to pretty much the villain in this movie. Uh, Javier Vandel plays uh, Raul Silva, a um, former um, agent of MI6 um, who used to be M's top agent but something went wrong something happened and uh, needed to say that he is um, bitter angry and wants revenge um, and this is where I think people will either like the uh, premise of the, of the movie or have a very serious beef with the movie because this is one of the villains although it is over the top and when I say over the top I mean very over the top um, he's a villain that you really are not used to seeing. Um, you're mostly seeing villains that wants to rule the world. You want to, you come to expect villains to have a motivation to try and get rid of Bond. This is a, t um, a villain who is, his, his main goal, his pretty much only goal, um, is getting revenge um, from M. Um, he wants um, M to suffer and pretty much want M dead. And um, that's been his motivation. There is no hidden plot. Yes, we have the secret agents, which was uh, which was stored in a data file, which he said he was going to release um, five every week, um, and which he did the first five, which caused the deaths of these agents. But overall, there's a hidden agenda, and this is where my complaint comes in. Um, the this plan he has uh, is not really convincing. And what I mean convincing is in doing this film, um, doing the film when he's finally captured, or where they say he wanted to be captured, um, and he escapes, Q informs um, James that he planned this. He planned this for years. And I'm staring at the screen and saying, no, he, it's no way he could have planned this for years. There's just no way I'm buying that he had years um, in the making um, just to just to get close to um to M it just does, it just doesn't make any sense and that's where uh, things get a little bit messy especially um how they plan to get at each other um James Bond of course trying to um protect M um and he does it in a way that um he has a plan but he's also basing it on luck um he's assuming automatically that uh Silver is going to you know fall for the bait and he's also assuming that uh, with just him, M, and some game um, housekeeper or gameskeeper, that's what um, he has in the mansion, which, by the way, that's the name of Skyfall, the Skyfall Mansion, his family's uh, um, residence uh, when he was grow grew up. He's assuming that uh, everything's going to work out fine once he gets there. And, of course, um, he doesn't really have a straight plan. It's, uh, you don't really understand that plan. More so, you don't really understand Harvey Van Dan's major motive because it's it's um, the scene. It felt to me that they um, they kind of rushed that part in. Um, they wasn't really calculated in my in the, in terms of um, their motivation leading up to that climactic. And when I say climax, I do mean climactic scene um, at the very end. Um, another thing I found, and this is another little nitpick, is that uh, <laughs> although and I gotta say, the entrance of Silville, this villain, um, was superb. Um, that one camera angle when he's walking to Bond, talking to Bond, um, pretty much um, be manipulated to Bond in ways that uh, had me just... 
I, I just started laughing because of the way he was talking and interacting. I don't want to give too much away, but if you um, plan to see this movie, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, it is pretty much, uh, the best way I can put it, homoerotic. Uh, but that's what makes this villain so good. That's what makes um, this character so memorable because it is pretty much that, that over-the-top character that you never expect to see in a Bond film. At least not since um, Diamonds um, All Forever. Uh, with Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid, um, so you know what I'm getting at when I'm when I'm saying it. But um, Javier Valdez does it very very well. I I really did enjoy his performance. However, I have to say, and this is just a small gripe. I never once, by seeing um, the interactions of Bond and this villain, I never once felt that Bond was threatened. And the the reason is because you never really he never really had beef with Bond in fact doing his interactions he was trying to say that hey Emma ain't, Emma ain't your friend she betrayed you um she's you know, she even um you know, lied about you being in physical shape and what I mean by that is because um during the beginning scene he's chasing a suspect uh which ended up him being mortally wounded not by the fact that he got strapped no um shot in his body by that machine gun that was shot for the through the uh through that bulldozer but by also getting shot by another fellow agent by accident and, uh which landed him um in into the um into the ocean from a bridge um and he came back of course but he came back a little rusty he's not uh the same um, bond um, as he was, and they make a very strong reference is that he is not the same Bond as he was. Uh, he uh, he needs to reinvent himself. And Harvey L. Van Damme um, character uh, is trying to mostly turn him um, by convincing him that he don't doesn't need to go by that old school anymore. Uh, the new school is the computers, and he's showing him that he's basically saying that uh, you know you want to. <laughs> You want to um, rig elections, you can do it by the press of the buttons. You know, also as a mumble jumble. So I never really once felt that he was a threat to Bond, but he definitely was a threat to M, and that's what makes this, um, char this character so unique. But in terms of him actually being a direct threat to 007, I never really once got that. It, it, that was part that also troubled me. What other also troubled me is this, and this is not just from this film, but the other two films um, combined. Um, and I'm going to give a pass to Naomi Harris's role because, let's be honest, um, not spoiling anything really, Naomi Harris plays Money Penny, um, Eve Money Penny, um, that who that character is, and they set it up pretty nicely um, with him and um, her and Bond. I actually liked their interactions. I thought they it was it worked just fine, especially with the character and um, that they are trying to go with. And the minute you see them interact, it was very clear that's Money Penny. There's no way that there's no way that that that's not can't be Money Penny. And sure enough, in the end, um, she introduced herself as Eve Money Penny. So no surprise there. So I can actually live with the way that chemistry is. That's been like that with most of the Bond films. Um, so. I, I give a free pass, and I'm actually looking forward, if she is going to return to the series, how much more she can do with that role, which pretty much will be limited um, in one shape or not. However, with that being said, um, Daniel Craig, to me, has to be the weakest Bond when it comes to Bond women. I mean, this is, I mean, I have never seen, with the probably exception of a Majesty Secret Service, and even that one was a strong Bond girl. I never once felt that the, the Danny Craig um, Bond had a very strong Bond girl. Um, you want to say um, Eva Green is a strong Bond girl, that's fine, she was good. But, you know, it, to me, when I see these Bond women, and when I see him interact, even though he got better, because um, that was one of my beef with, with him and Christina Royale, I never really felt him as a ladies' man Bond. Uh, I never really, really had any emotional attachment, even to this Bond girl. She came into the screen and I almost forgot she was actually there. Um, I don't know why she was in this movie. Um, she, she really did not give any depth to this film other than let's get Bond to point A to point B and that was it. And she got um, pretty much dealt with very, very quickly in this movie. So I really felt that that's something that uh, always bothered me with the Daniel Craig Bond is they never really gave him um, that iconic Bond girl. I'm not saying they should give her a crazy sexualized name, but 
come on, it's just give him a Bond girl that we can actually say, okay, he got the girl in the end, the end. He never got that, and not in all the three films. Um, but that's just a nitpick, and to be honest with you, if that's the only weakness that Bond has, and that's the way it's going to be within the Daniel Craig series, I'll take it because, and I'm getting to the good parts, the great parts about this film, um, Daniel Craig is superb as Bond in this movie, and I say that superb, I mean that he really plays Bond pretty much the closest I've ever seen to the book as anybody. I think the only person who tried to do this uh, pretty much ahead of his time, to be honest with you, was Timothy Dalton, and I think he actually mimics what Timothy Dalton was trying to do with his two films with um, Living Daylights and um, Lights and the Kill. Um, he's done it, and he's done it well. I like the fact that this movie had a story. It is not just driven by action. It is driven by story. You know there's a, there's a story to be to be told. There's an, um, there's a little bit of backstory between not only Bond's past, but M past as well. And they really did a good job of um, giving us details of both these characters' lives. And speaking of acting, everybody was superb in this film. Um, the main characters, that is. I enjoyed seeing the new Q. I enjoyed seeing seeing um, Eve on um, row. I enjoyed um, seeing Albert Vine, I hope I'm saying his name right, um, in this movie. Um, Judy Dutch, superb as always, um, and I will say this is her last run as M, and I was my only gripe was, if this is her last run at M, which it is, to, to give her a proper send off, and they did it, and they did it very, very well. Um, I was very, very happy of the role they gave um, Judy Dutch in this movie. Um, this is pretty much the most um, to do with M I have ever seen. Um, the last M film that M had a more stronger role, a stronger premise in the film was um, The World Is Not Enough. Um, this is pretty much following the same pattern where M is the centerpiece of the story. And this one, she is definitely the centerpiece of the story. Um, and um, the story pretty much goes to the details of um, loyalty, um, trust, it also goes into details of whether the old, old um, of schools of doing things is still the way of doing things. Um, and it, to me, it pretty much answers the questions that um, even though the new stuff is good, the old, there's always something that, um, that the old school can still bring to the table. And that is something I got from this film. From this, film. Um, this film did a great job of paying tribute to all the Bond films that came before it. Um, you saw um, little stuff, little trinkets that I think fans would pretty much smile and, and um, go gritty over, uh, especially the design in the end of the film, which I'm not going to give too much away to. Um, it actually plays tribute and bring it back into full circle. Um, the cinematography was superb in this movie. Um, this is the best cinematography that I've ever seen in a while in a Bond film. Um, and even the opening sequence, um, the best opening sequence in, in a Bond film in a long time. I don't remember the last great opening sequence I think I, I, I have seen in a Bond film. I, um, probably since GoldenEye that I was really in awe of how well done they did the opening sequence in this film. The editing was smooth, which was a big problem I had uh, with Quantum Assange. And I'm just going to go on the record. I didn't think Quantum Assange was terrible. I just felt that it didn't balance itself out the way um, this film did. It not only balanced itself out um, well, it, it really kept um, me interested from the beginning to end. The pacing here, uh, it knew when to speed up, it knew when to slow down, but most importantly, I never, I never one time when I saw this film that I got bored. Um, that is a very big key. Uh, if I'm losing interest, it's hard for me to pick back up, and I never lost interest. I wanted to see more. I wanted to see more of these characters. Um, the direction, um, um, Mendez has did a great job in directing. I thought his directing was fine. Um, I think he... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the silhouette fight was pretty much good and tense. I think he did a little bit too much with the silhouette fights. Um, the the one with the when it was when he um, tracked down the man who he was originally chasing um, in the beginning scene. It was great. It was intense. Um, yet there was other scenes where I felt they went a little bit too much into that scenery. Um, I'm talking about when Don um, Silva is walking away from the mansion, which was being it, which was uh, pretty much in ruins. Um, it, it really did, I, I really strained my eyes a little bit, and I got bad eyes to begin with, uh, but that did cause me to strain a little bit. Um, so, he did went to well a little bit too much, but not to the point where I said I'm screaming at the, at the, uh, at the screen saying, it's another way, I want to see their face. Um, the score. How can I put this way? It's not a terrible score. 
but it's not something I'm gonna sit there and say, yeah, this is this is a Bond score I'm gonna remember. At least they played the Bond theme at the right time. I will give a credit for that. Uh, but if you ask me honestly, which one I rather choose, Newman or Arnold? I'm gonna choose Arnold because, to be honest with you, he knows how to do the Bond score um, well and uh, and better and uh, more into the Bond style, style that I came. Um, to love over the years. Um, not to say he was terrible at it, uh, but it's not memorable. It will not pretty much be in my most um, I need to have the CD list. Um, as for Adele, I know a lot of people got on me about the, um, about the theme, but I think when you see the title sequence, I think it works best for that title sequence. Um, I still think it's one of the better Bond theme scores that we've ever heard in a while, um, especially after hearing from Die Another Day, um, Quantum of Silas, uh, which had a good beat, but the but the vocals were just all over the place. Um, I actually like You Know um, you know My Name is a good, good song, but keep in mind, it took me a long time to get used to it. Uh, it took me a while, so in all, I think this is one of the better Bond song theme, so theme songs. Um, is definitely settled. It definitely went back to the to the age of Goldfinger, where the song um, pretty much says it all. And after seeing the opening, I think it matched well with what was going on. Um, in all, I think the um, the editing. Um, I think the. I think one of the major problems I think people had was that they they went back on the violence. I didn't think they went back on the violence. I think that um, the stuff they did was pretty much intense. Um, the character. Um, that uh, the that Har uh, that Harvey uh, Bardem has done was uh, well done, um, and there was some ten scene moments that you really don't know what the hell was going to happen. Um, that's how good he was, and I really did enjoy um, this villain. This is probably one of the best villains we've seen in a while. Um, I um, I will say that, and this is probably one of the better Bond villains. Um, that Daniel Craig had so far, right next to um, the Shifa, um, and I put him on the on the top list as well. So um, he never disappointed me, and uh, and I think a lot of people said that he stole the show. Um, I think he was definitely one of the point reasons why this film worked. But I'm giving more credit to Judy Dench again. Um, her performance in this film was uh, very very strong. Um, to the point where you just basically every time she's on the screen you're paying attention to what's going on um, many people consider her as the true Bond girl and you know what after thinking this through I actually agree she is definitely uh, one of the true Bond girls we had in a long time so uh, with that being said um, I'm gonna give this film three and a half out of four um, just missed the form for Star Wars, but like I said, there are some few things um, that I think they um, that um, I can't simply ignore. I think they rush a lot of things. They're planning. It's a little bit. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's definitely not there. Do I consider this better than Casino Royale? I think Casino Royale is a better film, but I also felt that this film is definitely among the top ten best Bond films. Um, again, I will have to, you know, literally go back and order my favorite Bond films to see where I rank it at. Um, am I, do I consider it, um, better as, um, Rush for Love? I don't think so, <laughs> but, uh, I gotta look at it all again and see where all these films come out. But I think that it, in all, I think Christina Royal just wins out, um, out of this film, but just by pretty much a hair. So that's my honest review on this movie, three and a half stars. Um, I like to hear your opinion on this on, on this film. Do you like the film? Do you did not like the film? Uh, what's your favorite Bond film? Um, let me know your feedback. I like to hear from you. Until then, this is J77 saying, take care, be safe. I'll talk to you soon.